When I was seven years old, my best friend lived one street over, right around the block, and he lived in the house right behind ours. One summer day, my friend invited me to spend the night at his house with his family. The plan was for me to come for dinner and then sleep in the extra bed my friend had in his room. This would be the first night I'd ever spent away from home and my family, with the exception, of course, of visits to my grandparents. It sounded like fun. Indeed, it was. After dinner, we played all sorts of games. Most importantly, we tormented my friend's sister, and then we finally went to bed. When the lights went out, we told jokes and stories and talked into the night. Then at the end of a long story I was telling, my friend made no reply. All I heard was the deep breathing of someone who had fallen soundly asleep, presumably right in the middle of my story. Perhaps it was then that I realized my calling was to become a preacher. <laughs> anyway, there I was, still wide awake, with nothing else to do but look out the window that was right next to my bed. What did I see? Across the darkness of my friend's backyard, beyond where our two backyards touched, across the expanse of my backyard made larger by the night, I saw the lights of home. There was my house. I could even see my father moving through the various rooms. Looking from afar, everything at home was exactly as it should have been, except for one thing. I was not there. Suddenly, my first encounter with homesickness burst upon me. I felt unmoored, disconnected, outside of where I lived and moved and had my being. I knew in my head that the distance was not great and that the night would not last long. But the head seldom rules the heart at such times. What could I do? I couldn't leave or wake anyone else up. That would be too embarrassing. So instead, I waited for dawn, tossing and turning without much sleep. To paraphrase this morning's reading from 2 Peter, one day seemed like a thousand years. Over 365 years ago, George Frederick Handel chose to begin his mighty, massive work, the Messiah, with the words we heard in the Old Testament reading. And here are the words of that old, beloved translation. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem, and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned. For she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. The words originate with Isaiah the prophet, who first spoke them some 500 years before Jesus. Isaiah preached good news to the people in exile. The Jews were captives in Babylon. The Babylonians had conquered them carried them away from Jerusalem. For decades they had languished in Babylonian internment camps, all the while mourning their separation from Jerusalem. As the psalmist said, 
By the waters of Babylon we sat down and wept. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? They were deeply, spiritually homesick, unmoored, disconnected, far from the lights of Zion where they lived and moved and had their being. Then came Isaiah, speaking words of comfort. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith your God. Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. For the Jews, this meant that they would be going home. The way they would have to travel from Babylon to Jerusalem was a great deal longer than few backyards. Straight across was 600 miles of desert. The more hospitable route was close to 900 miles. Mountains, valleys, rough places, and rough people would block their way. But God himself was going to prepare the way. God brought the Jews home again to Jerusalem. The night was over. The day had dawned. The exile was finished. They were home. The problem was that Jerusalem turned out to be not at all the heaven on earth they remembered. The city was in ruins, the temple destroyed. And so those who felt homesick in Babylon still felt homesick in Jerusalem. The spiritual ache did not go away. The inner exile was not finished. It never is. Do you know the experience of homesickness? Have you endured a period of exile from that which anchors you? When you could only look from afar at the lights of home or the center of yourself? Perhaps that first week at summer camp was your introduction to the irrational fear we call homesickness. Maybe it happened when you went off to college. But the homesickness the readings speak of today is deeper than the disconnect we may feel when parted from loved ones, familiar surroundings. We have a strange yearning for perfection, permanence, and presence that no experience on earth ever seems to satisfy. We have a longing for unity that haunts us all our days. We are born with a memory of it, but we are never able to find it in this life. We have a longing for mercy and truth to meet together, for righteousness and peace to kiss each other, as the psalmist says. But for now, these are strangers, disconnected from each other. What do we do with this unsatisfied desire? Well, we try to satisfy it. We seek fulfillment in places that simply cannot deliver the goods, in work, in family, in political or social causes. We project our longing onto the celebration of Christmas, hoping that this will be the year we grasp all the elusive intimacy that carols and lights and parties hold just beyond our reach. But the ache persists year after year after year. What some do then is uncork the bottle and turn up the radio to escape the noise of a calling that won't leave us alone. Many years ago, I went to visit a friend who was going to school in New England. He picked me up at the airport in his battered old car, a Buick if I remember correctly a car that was so rusted out I was afraid my suitcase would fall through the hole in his trunk. And we got finally onto the highway, leaving the airport, and 
Suddenly we heard a rhythmic thumping, the slapping sound coming from the rear of the car. What did my friend do as this rubber shredded from his tire? Did he repent in any way? Not at all. What he actually did, and this is a true story, he turned up the radio and kept on driving saying, that's how I deal with all the noises this car makes. That's how some people go through life. Turning up the noise to drown out the voice of a prophet or the sound of their deepest longing. But the spiritual ache does not go away. The inner exile is never finished. Have you ever wondered what the source of our longing is? C.S. Lewis, the Anglican apologist, explained it this way. If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. I must keep alive in myself the desire for my true country, which I shall not find until after my death. I must never let it get snowed under or turned aside. I must make it the main object of life to press on to that other country and to help others do the same. St. Paul also spoke of this other country when he wrote that we are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. And when he said that our commonwealth, our citizenship is in heaven, and it is from that that we await a savior, Jesus the Christ. So the source of our longing is God. It is God who shines the light in the darkness. It is God who haunts us with his messengers, the prophets. Our deepest homesickness is for heaven. I remember again my first night away from home. Once my friend fell asleep, I looked with longing at the lights of my own house just a few backyards away. The minutes seemed like hours. I had never before known such a feeling. But I also remember feeling something else, a feeling beneath the homesickness yet connected to it. And it was this, a deep sense of belonging to that home shining in the darkness, and also deep gratitude for it. Sure enough, when morning came at the appointed time, my father rang the doorbell of my friend's home. He had come to bring me home. And although I was much too grown up to show it, I rejoiced to behold his appearing. I know that at this time of year, when you have perhaps hundreds of cards to address and mail, shopping to do, decorations to put up, parties to attend and family plans to attend to, I know that at this time of year, the last thing you want to hear is that this is a time to watch, to listen, to turn down the volume, to be patient, to wait for God. I know that this is the last thing you want to hear, but perhaps it is the thing we most need to hear. This Advent, every Advent, our challenge is to linger at the window of this mortal life. It is to look at our true heavenly home with longing and gratitude, and with the sure confidence that when morning dawns, God will come to bring us home. So hear this, all you that are homesick for heaven, 
all you who are longing for a love that this world cannot fully deliver. Hear again the words of Isaiah the prophet, proclaiming good news to the people in exile. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned. For she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. 